Hi, my name is Linda Chen and I am 47 years old. So my parents came to the United States with two children, my mm -hmm. two sisters. So my older sister was two and my second sister was one. Mm -hmm. And I was born uh, five years after my second sister, after they had come to the United States. My earliest childhood memory um, would be growing up at my, the back of my mom's grocery store. So she, my mother and my father had a grocery store in East LA. It was called Happy Valley. And we had this little grocery store with a room in the back. I remember being with my father and uh, my father taking care of me. My mother is very pragmatic. So as far as, you know, a lot of things growing up, she's, like I said, she's not a very sentimental person. She's sentimental in her own way, but um, she, she said that even with me, um, when she was pregnant, she said that she, I was born very small because she said that she didn't want to, they owned a grocery store, I said, so she didn't want to um, eat or drink too much and have to go to the bathroom because then she wouldn't be able to watch the register. So she said that I was born very small. But, and, that, and that's just how, you know, those are the stories. So my father would look at me when I was growing up and he would say, you know, uh, you know, you're 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 so pretty. You could have gone for Miss Korea, but you're so short. And I was like, well, it wasn't like I was trying to be short. I mean, you know, didn't really didn't give him proper nutrition, you know, as even as an infant. So it was kind of hard for. But he he didn't say it in a way that was blaming me. It was more lamenting that I did not that I was not born um, with all what he would have wanted. My mother, she only spoke to us in Korean. So we are fluent in Korean. And it was odd because growing up in the 70s in America and you know everybody had was either Chinese or Japanese, no one knew who Koreans were. It was really hard to have an identity. You know, um, when I was really young, we, I, I grew up, I told you in East LA and the school that I went to was predominantly Hispanic. So from there, I went to a predominantly white school in Arcadia. In third grade, I became a latchkey kid. So my mom was in East LA working in a store and I was sent to, I was living in my house in Arcadia and I was going to school in Arcadia because my mother didn't want, she wanted me to have a better education than the one in East LA. But that required that I did not have any parental supervision. So I would walk home from school. And then the moment I got home from school, I'd have to call my mother. And if I was five minutes late, my mom would start calling because that was her way of controlling and knowing where I was. So I was not allowed to go to friends' houses. Friends weren't allowed to come to our house because, you know, friends would, people would steal from you. I remember my mother she would like, she was so good. I mean, that woman was like a detective. She would like look at the carpet and she would notice if there was footprints in the carpet and she would measure the footprints and she would be like, there was somebody in the house. Like She was that good. So we were, I was basically locked down as a child. And you know, when you're at home and all that good seventies canned food, that's what I ate. Chef Bardi, beef stew in a can, dinty more beef stew and spam and rice. So by the time I was in third grade, I was starting to put on weight because I didn't exercise. I ate really crappy food and I was not allowed to do anything outside of waiting for my mother to come home from work. So putting on weight, not being the cutest girl, my mother at that point in third grade, because she didn't want to even brush my hair. It was just too much. She cut my hair really short. So now not only was I chubby, I was Korean amongst a bunch of white kids. I had short hair and I looked like a little boy. So it was not easy growing up. So having this identity problem, um, it, was, it was very challenging for me. And at some point, I don't really know where it kind of fixed where I was like, I, I wanna learn how to read. In Korean and how to write because although I could speak I couldn't read and write 
And I remember teaching myself how to read and write Korean. So by the time I got into college, um, I was taking Korean classes at George Washington University. I was taking Korean all the way up to Hanmun. Yeah. So having this type of feeling of wanting to know my heritage and not really getting that from my mother, because my mother was, you know, she's kind of void of all of that. You know, that was kind of nonsense. It, was it wasn't nonsense. It was more unnecessary for my mother. And so I, in college, applied to go to Yonsei University for a summer program. So I went to Yonsei. I just called my mom and I said, hey, mom, I, I need $3,000. She goes, why do you need three? I'm going to Yonsei. She never balked. She never said, no, you can't do that. I, that's how we grew up. It was more like, you know, okay, I have this opportunity. I need some money. Okay, fine, you can go. So I went to Korea and that was traumatic. Traumatic in the sense that um, it was a wonderful experience to go to Korea. It was also very difficult at that time to go to Korea because um, being a kyopu and going into Korea and people looking at me and saying, you, you don't look Korean, you know, and they would ask me, um, they would ask me if my father was a Weibu Saram, you know, which was like, wow, I, I never thought that, you know, I wouldn't, I mean, I'm clearly not white, right? <laughs> so my parents are both Korean. So you would think that I would be accepted in Korea, but they looked at me and I was not Korean. So that was a little bit of a um, heartbreak that, you know, I wasn't accepted in Korea because it was like, oh, you're too dark or um, you're, you're too fat. Uh, why are you so fat? You know, just, it's like real. And at that time I wasn't even fat. It was just in their view, like, you're, you're too fat. But in saying, and, and also in Korea, something very traumatic happened. I was at Yonsei and um, I ended up getting uh, raped and beaten by three of the local men in Korea. And I didn't tell anybody when I was in Korea. It was very, um, it was one of those moments where you realize you're a foreigner. And also, you know, back then it's, there wasn't really many, any rights for women. You know, you can't go around talking about these things. No one's going to, they're going to say, what did you do? You know, what did you do to bring that on? I mean, I, you, at the time I was a smoker. Uh, and if you walk down the street in Korea, smoking a cigarette, the Ajashis would come over, grab your cigarette, throw it on the ground and stamp, stamp, stamp on it. That's just how Korea was. So if you have this like misogynistic society, you think for one moment, if you came in as a Korean American and said, this is what happened to me, anybody would listen to you. So that happened in Korea and I came back to America and I remember I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my parents or anybody. I went back to George Washington University. I went into the health clinic. And the first thing I told the health clinic was, I said, you know, um, what gamut of testing do you do for a rape victim? And they said, oh, we do gonorrhea, syphilis, da, 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 da. And they just listed it off. And I said, okay, I think I need that testing done. And that was, that was it. That's how I handled it. It caused me a lot of problems to have that happen to me. I was 20. It caused me a lot of problems um, as far as how I dealt with myself and um, the trauma that I went through that I didn't realize I had gone through because I had buried it. But how it surfaced for me in my 20s is I, I started to uh, do a lot of things that in retrospect, looking at it would be considered like self-hatred. I was doing drugs. I was distancing myself from people. Um, and yeah, it was a really difficult time to get over all of that. I'm glad I'm over all of that. And when I, I, I didn't go to any therapy for that either. I just kind of dealt with that um, by myself. I told my mother, I think maybe four years after what had happened. 
But by then I was already like, I don't know why I even told her. Um, it was more of a, I, I don't know. I think I was just trying to, I think at the time I was coming off of something and I just kind of blurted it out. And I remember she was really angry, but then we never talked about it after that. It's almost as if it never happened. She was angry that they had done that to me. And that was enough for me to know that my mother defended me. That was enough for me. I didn't, we don't speak about it. And that's just how we deal with it. Um, how, even with all of that, that had happened in Korea, um, I still identified with being Korean. I love being Korean American. I love that I have a culture, you know, and I love that I can pass that culture to my children. As Koreans, our tendency is to not share things that are real. We want everything to be sugar-coated and look nice, but there's real trauma. And the more that we rip off that Band-Aid and the more we become vulnerable, and the more we expose that we are real people with the same problems that everybody else goes through, the more healing that can occur for other people. Who I was at 20 with all of these things that happened to me, who I was at 23 when I was doing all my partying is not who I am today. And I think that's really important that people understand that whatever happened to you in the past does not does not identify you when who you are today. You can create anything and you can become anything you want to be and you are not defined by any sort of box, you know? And so if you were to look at me today and you said, wow, that was you, that's it. you can come out of anything because we're all strong. My name is Linda Chen, and this is my Korean American story.